increasingly apparent. The biblical injunction to remember that the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the children is a literal statement anent the human heritage of the beast from Lemuria and Atlantis. Syphilis and tuberculosis have been extensively prevalent in the first half of the Aryan race, in which we now find ourselves, and today they not only affect the organs of generation or the lungs, as they did in the early stages of their appearance but now have involved the bloodstream and consequently the entire organism of the human body. Much has been done in the last 50 years to bring the great Atlantean disease of tuberculosis. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 140 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Under Control by Simplicity of Living Pure and Ample Food and Good Air Much is being done to control, finally, the syphilitic diseases, and both will eventually be stamped out, not only by sound treatment and the discoveries of medical science, but because the race, as it becomes more mentally polarized, will itself deal with the problem from the angle of common sense will decide that the physical sins exact too heavy a penalty and that the possession of that which you have not earned or needed, and which consequently is not rightfully yours, is not worthwhile. It is around these basic ideas that the World War 1914-1945 was fought. We call the unlawful possession of other people's land, territory, goods and chattels, aggression, but this is the same thing in principle as stealing, theft and rape. Today these evils are not only individual sins and faults, but can be national characteristics. The World War has brought the whole problem to the surface of the human consciousness and the ancient Atlantean struggle is being bitterly waged, with the probability that this time the Great White Lodge will triumph. That was not the case in the earlier conflict. Then the war was ended by the intervention of the planetary Logos himself, and that ancient civilization went down into the deeps and was engulfed in water, the symbol of purity, sanitation and universality, and therefore appropriate as an ending for what one of the masters has called, a tubercularly oriented race. Death by drowning and death by obscure physical means which I am not at liberty to describe have both been tried in the effort to salvage humanity. Today, death by fire is the applied technique, and it promises to be successful. In contradistinction to the great Lemurian and Atlantean crises, humanity is now far more mentally alert, the causes of the trouble are recognized, motives are seen more clearly, and the will to good and to change past evil conditions is stronger than ever before. What is beginning to manifest now in the public consciousness is something utterly good and new. The subjective reasons given to account for the appearance of these two most ancient racial diseases may well appear to the non-esotericists as possible but not probable and as fanciful and too general in nature. This cannot be helped. These two groups of diseases are of such exceedingly ancient origin that I have called them inherent in the planetary life itself and the heritage of all humanity, for in all, the breaking of certain laws will bring about these diseases. If I care to do so, I could take you still further back into the realm of cosmic evil as it prevails in our solar system and affects the planetary Logos, who is still numbered among the imperfect gods.
the outer form of the planet through which he expresses himself is impregnated to a certain depth with the seeds and germs of these two diseases, as immunity is built up, however, as methods of cure are developed, as preventive medicine comes into its own, and as man himself arrives at increasing mental and soul control of the animal and desire natures, these forms of human suffering will disappear, and no matter what statistics may say they are disappearing among the more controlled areas of the human family. As the life of God expressing itself as individual divinity and universal divinity pulsates more powerfully through the kingdoms of nature, these two penalties of evil doing will inevitably no longer be required and will disappear for three reasons. Copyright Copyright 1998 Rules Trust 141 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4, Esoteric Healing 1. The orientation of humanity towards the light is steadily changing and, light dispels all evil. The light of knowledge and the recognition of causes will bring about those carefully planned conditions which will make the syphilitic diseases and tuberculosis things of the past. 2. The centers below the diaphragm will be subjected to a cleansing, lifting process, the life of the sacral center will be controlled and the energy mutually focused there will be extended in creative living, through the medium of the throat center, the solar plexus center will have its energy lifted to the heart, and the trend of human selfishness will then die out. 3. Complete cures, implemented by science, will bring about a gradual fading out of contagion. Another reason which will bring about the cessation of those practices and modes of living and desiring which account for these diseases is one little recognized as yet. It was referred to by the Christ when he spoke of the time when nothing secret would remain hidden and when all secrets would be shouted aloud from the house tops. The growth of telepathic registration and of the psychic powers such as clairvoyance and clairaudience will eventually tend to strip humanity of the privacy in which to sin. The powers whereby the masters and the higher initiates can ascertain the psychic state and physical condition of humanity, its quality and consciousness, are already beginning to show themselves in advanced humanity. People will sin, commit evil deeds and satisfy inordinate desire, but they will be known to their fellowmen and nothing that they do will be carried out in secret. Someone or some group will be aware of the tendencies in the life of a man, and even of the incidents in which he satisfies some demand of his lower nature, and the fact of this possibility will act as a great deterrent, a far greater deterrent than you can imagine. Man is indeed his brother's keeper, and the keeping will take the form of knowledge and of boycott and sanction, as it is called today in reference to the penalizing of nations. I would have you ponder on these two modes of treating wrongdoing. They will be practically automatically applied as a matter of good taste, right feeling and helpful intention by individuals and groups to other individuals and groups, and in this way crime and the tendency to evil doing will gradually be stamped out. It will be realized that all crime is founded upon some form of disease, or upon a glandular lack or overstimulation, based in turn upon the development or the underdevelopment of some one or other of the centers. An enlightened public opinion, informed as to man's constitution and aware of the great law of cause and effect, will deal with the criminal through medical means right environmental conditions, and the penalties of boycott and sanctions. I have no time to enlarge upon these matters, 
but these suggestions will give you food for thought. C. Cancer. We come now to a consideration of the rapidly increasing and typical Atlantean disease which we call cancer. We have spoken of one basic widespread disease related to the physical body, we have dealt superficially with another which is a product of the desire nature. Cancer, in our present cycle, the Aryan, is definitely a result of the activity of the lower concrete mind and of the stimulation of the etheric body which the mind can bring about. It is a major disease incident. Copyright Copyright 1998 Uses Trust 142 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing To stimulation, as far as the Aryan masses are concerned, just as heart disease is also a disease of stimulation, affecting very largely the advanced types of humanity who, through interest in business and leadership, often sacrifice their lives and pay the penalty of misuse and over-concentrated energy by developing various forms of acute heart trouble. Disciples and initiates are prone also to suffer from this disease, owing to the awakening into violent activity of the heart center. In the one case, the life energy flowing through the heart is employed past all human tolerance in handling human affairs. In the other, the heart center opens up and the strain put upon the organ of the heart is too great, and heart disease supervenes. A third cause of heart disease is due to the premature or deliberately planned lifting of the energy of the solar plexus to the heart, thus putting an unexpected strain upon it. I am viewing naturally in broad generalization. Later evidence will go to show the types of activity which will evoke corresponding difficulty within the heart. Heart disease will increase greatly as we enter into the new root trace, particularly during the interim wherein the fact of the centers, their nature and qualities, is admitted and they consequently become the objective of trained attention. Energy follows thought, and this mental focusing upon the centers will inevitably produce overstimulation of all the centers, and this in spite of care and a carefully developed science of the centers. It is something which cannot be avoided, owing to the nervous and uneven unfoldment of man. Later, this stimulation will be regulated and controlled, and the heart will be subjected only to a general strain, along with all the other centers. Cancer is a disease most definitely related to the centers, and it will be found that the center in the area wherein the cancer exists is overactive, with a consequent increase of energy pouring through the related bodily substance. This energy and the overstimulation of a center can be due not only to the activity of the center and its consequent radiation, but also the suppression imposed by the mind upon any activity of a particular center. This brings about a damming up of energy, and again we have the creation of too much concentrated energy in any particular area. One of the main sources of cancer is related to the sacral center, and therefore to the sex organ, has been the well-intentioned suppression of the sex life, and of all thought connected with the sex life, by misguided aspirants, they are those who find the teaching, monastic and celibate, of the Middle Ages the line of least resistance. In that period of time, Good people taught that sex was evil and wicked, something not to be mentioned, and a potent source of trouble. 
normal reaction, instead of being controlled and transmuted into creative activity, were violently suppressed and all thoughts and then the sex life were refused expression. Nevertheless, energy follows the direction of thought, with the result that that particularly magnetic type of energy attracted an increasing number of cells and atoms to itself, therein is found the source of the tumors, growths and cancers so prevalent today. The same thing can be said about the violent inhibition imposed by an aspirant upon all emotional reactions and feelings. In their effort to control the astral body, these people resort to a process of direct inhibition and suppression. That suppression makes of the solar plexus center a great reservoir of drastically. Copyright Copyright 1998 Rules of Trust 143 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Retained energy. Transmutation of the emotions into aspiration and love and directed control is not present, and the existence of this vibrant reservoir of power brings about cancer of the stomach, of the liver, and sometimes of the entire area of the abdomen. I simply mention these causes overactivity of a center and the retention of energy, unexpressed and inhibited, as fruitful sources of cancer. We come back in every case, as you can see, to the fact of the existence of the centers and their physiological effects. So much emphasis has been laid upon the qualities and characteristics which man will develop when the centers are all properly organized and directed, that the effects of the energy which they receive and distribute into the physical organism have been largely overlooked. Two factors in connection with the centers and the bloodstream therefore warrant repetition and attention. One. The bloodstream is the agent of the glandular system as it, in its turn, is an effect of the centers. The bloodstream carries to every part of the body those essential elements of which we know so little and which are responsible for making man psychologically what he is, and thus physically control his equipment. 2. The bloodstream is also the life and carries throughout the organism an aspect of the energy stored up by the centers which is not directly related to the endocrine system, it penetrates, by its radiation, into the bloodstream and into all the veins, arteries and capillaries within the area controlled by the center under consideration. This permeating energy of life itself, localized and qualified, can be either life-giving or death-bestowing. All diseases, except those due to accidents, wounds resulting in infection, and epidemics, can in the last analysis be traced to some condition of the centers, and therefore to energy running wild, to energy overactive and misdirected or insufficient and lacking altogether, are retained instead of used and transmuted into a higher corresponding center of energy. The mystery of the blood still remains to be solved, and will receive increasing attention as time goes on. The anemias, so prevalent today, are also due to excessive energy. I can only lay down general indications, state causes, and then leave to the intelligent investigators the task of studying effects after accepting as a possible hypothesis the suggestions I have made.
a proper study of the ductless glands, and later of the entire glandular structure of the body, and of the bloodstream will establish them as the paramount source of physical difficulty. Inevitably, though slowly and patiently, the investigators will be forced back upon the centers and will come to include in their calculations a subjective nervous system, the entire subjective system of nadis which underlie the nerves throughout the body, and will demonstrate that these factors are responsible for the major diseases and the many subsidiary diseases and obscure complaints which plague humanity. The open-minded investigator, however, who starts with an acceptance of the fact of the centers, regarding them as possibly present and eventually capable of demonstration, will make far more rapid progress, diseases will then be brought under. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 144 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Control by a system of Laya Yoga, the science of the centers, which will be the sublimated form of the Laya Yoga of Atlantean days. Then the advanced student will control the centers by the power of thought. In the yoga of the future, through meditation and alignment and right practices, the centers will be brought under the direct control of the soul, a very different thing to the control of the centers by the mind and one for which the masses of men are not yet ready. To this the science of the breath will be added, not breathing exercises is now taught, with often such dangerous results, but a breathing rhythm imposed by the mind through which the soul can work, and which will not require anything more than the simple rhythmic physical breath but which will reorganize the subtler bodies and bring the centers into ordered activity, according to Ray and Point in Evolution. I deal not with the pathology of these diseases that has been well considered and dealt with by ordinary medicine. I seek only in this part of our discussions to emphasize the subjective causes and the objective effects. The two must be related. The activity, excessive or inadequate, of the centers is the subjective cause, but remains yet unrecognized except by esotericists. The causes the apparent causes which are themselves the result of a true subjective cause, are initiated by the physical man himself, either in this life or an earlier one, a point which we will discuss later. I have given you in the above much to consider, and as you ponder and think, as you study cases and types, as you watch the characteristics and qualities of those you know and which work out in some form of eventual disease, light will come. It is only the necessity of indicating the major sources of diseases and not overlooking them, even if the subject is too esoteric for the average intelligence to grasp, that has led me to include our second point. 2. Diseases arising from obscure planetary conditions. It is obviously impossible for me to enlarge upon this subject, for it is not possible to give even a slight indication which could lead, at present, to any process of verification. What I say will have to be taken on trust and is dependent upon what I believe is recognized as my proof veracity and integrity. I shall, and can, say but little, only enough to indicate one fruitful cause of disease and one of such great aid that it is inherent in the life of the planet itself. These diseases have no subjective or subtle origin, they are not the result of emotional conditions or of undesirable mental processes. They are not psychological in nature and therefore cannot be traced to any activity of the centers. 
They originate from within the planetary life itself and from its life aspects, having a direct emanatory effect upon the individual atoms of which the dense physical body is composed. This is a point of importance to remember. The source of any disease of this nature induced by the planet itself, is due primarily, therefore, to an external impact of certain vibratory emanations coming from the surface of the planet, engendered deep within the planet. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 145 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4, Esoteric Healing and impinging upon the dense physical body. These radiations play upon the units of energy which, in their totality, constitute the atomic substance of the body. They are unconnected in any way with the bloodstream or with the nervous system. They are consequently impossible to trace or isolate, because man is today so highly organized and integrated that these external impacts immediately evoke a response from the nervous system. The modern physician is at present unable to distinguish between the diseases arising from within the patient's own interior mechanism, tangible or intangible, and those which are in the nature of extraneous irritants, producing immediate effects upon the sensitive organism of man's body. I am not here referring to infectious or contagious difficulties. Perhaps one point which I might helpfully emphasize is that it is this obscure planetary effect, obscure to us, at this time upon the physical body which is the major cause of death where the purely animal form nature is concerned, or the forms of life present in the animal and vegetable kingdom, and to a lesser and slower degree in the mineral kingdom likewise. Death as far as the human being is concerned, is increasingly due to the planned intent and planned withdrawal of the soul, under the pressure of its own formulated intent. This is true to some degree of all who die, except those who are of so low a grade of intelligence that the soul is practically little more than an overshadowing agency. Of all who die, Highly developed or not, the later stages of dissolution, effective after the conscious withdrawal of the soul conscious on the part of the soul and becoming increasingly conscious on the part of the dying person, are taken over by this death bestowing power of the planetary life itself. In the case of the subhuman kingdoms in nature, death is the direct result of this obscure activity of the planet. The only idea as to its functioning which I can give you is that the soul of all non-human forms of life is an inherent aspect of the substance of which the planet is itself constructed. This soul can be withdrawn according to cycles, undetermined yet by science but fixed and certain in their working, apart from great planetary accidents or the direct action of the fourth kingdom in nature. This innate planetary power leads to the death of an animal and, in the larger sweep of evolution, to the extinction of a species, it leads also in time to the death of the forms of the vegetable kingdom and is also one of the causes which leads to the autumnal cycle in the year, producing the, Sara, the yellow leaf, the loss of verdure in the grass, and those cyclic manifestations which indicate not alone death, upon a temporary and passing scale, but the complete cessation of vitality within a form. Times of perishing, or cyclic manifestations of the, destroyer aspect, within the planet itself. These are necessarily difficult matters for you to grasp. This radiatory activity of the planetary life, 
cyclic in nature and eternally present, is closely related to the influence of the first ray. It is that aspect of the ray of will or power which produces the dissolution of the form, and the corruption and dissipation of the bodily vehicle until it has been again completely reabsorbed into the substance of the planet. A focused use of Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 146 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing The imagination will aid you in discovering how vitally constructed this agency of divinity can be. Death has been present upon our planet from the very night of time itself. Forms have come and gone. Death has overtaken plants and trees, animals and the forms of human beings for untold eons. And yet our planet is not a charnel house as it well might be in the face of this fact, but is still a thing of beauty, unspoiled even by man. The processes of dying and of dissolution and the dissipation of forms goes on every moment without producing contagious contamination or the disfiguring of the surface of the earth. The results of dissolution are beneficent in effect. Ponder on this beneficent activity and on the beauty of the divine plan of death and disappearance. With man, death takes on two aspects of activity, the human soul differs from the soul in the non-human forms in that it is itself a full and, on its own plane, an effective expression of the three divine aspects, it determines within certain limits, based on time conditions and spatial necessity, its entrance into human form and its exit therefrom. Once this exit has been made and the soul has withdrawn the thread of consciousness from the brain and its life thread from the heart, certain life processes still persist. They are now under the influence of the planetary life, however, and to these the physical elemental, the sum total of the living atoms of the body nature, is responsive. I would have you know the occult paradox that death is the result of living processes. Death, or the death producing energy emanating from the planet, brings about the complete disruption of the bodily organism and its reduction to its essential elements, chemical and mineral, plus certain inorganic substances which are susceptible of absorption into the soil of the planet itself. Death, as the result of soul activity produces, therefore, the withdrawn from the body of the, light body and of the subtle body, leaving the dense form and its component parts to the benign processes of planetary control. This soul activity produces death, as we know it from the human angle. It is necessary here to point out that this ability of the planetary logos to extract the life essence innate in each atom, produces what might be called deterioration in the structure of the form at any point from whence this life essence is emitted. This brings about conditions which eventually become apparent visually, thus disease and the tendency to die, become recognizable. Therefore, the withering of a flower, death from old age in an animal or a tree, and the many diseases of the human being are all brought about by the pull of the powerful life of the planet. Speaking esoterically, this is an aspect of what is called, erroneously, the law of gravitation. This law is, again speaking esoterically, an aspect of the law of return, which governs the relation of a unit of life in form to its emanating source. Thus thou art, unto thus thou shalt return, is a statement of occult law. In the curious evolution of words, as any good dictionary will show, the word, dust, comes from two roots, 
one meaning, win, and the other, falling to pieces. The significance of both these meanings will be apparent and the sequence of ideas is arresting. With the withdrawing of the wind or breath, a falling to pieces eventuate, and this is a true and significant statement. As the greater life absorbs the lesser life, the disappearance of that which the life has in form takes place. This is true of all forms in the subhuman kingdoms as they respond to the drag or pull of the planetary life, it is true also of the Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 147 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Human form as it reacts to the call of the soul to return its life principle to the soul, via the Sutratma, and to return its consciousness to its registering source. In this process and interaction, the form shows the results of being either the receiver of the tide of life from the planet or as the releaser of that life, under cyclic law, to its general reservoir of living energy. Upon these two reactions depends the health or the disease of the form in various stages and states of response and under the action of other contributing and conditioning factors. There are three major stages in the life cycle of all subhuman forms, and in the human form likewise when the soul is simply an overshadowing force and not an integrated energy. 1. The stage of inflowing, of vitalization and of growth. 2. The stage of resistance, wherein the form preserves its own integrity for a temporary cycle, determined by its species and environment, thus resisting successfully any, full, of the all-enveloping life and any reabsorption of its vitality. 3. The stage of emission, wherein the pull of the greater life of the planet draws out and absorbs the weakening lesser life. This weakening process is a part of a cyclic law, as the old adage, the days of a man are three score years and ten, hence. When the average of a general cyclic period is normally run, a point of weakening in the bodily tissue will surely and gradually arise. Disease or deterioration of some part of the form usually eventuates in death supervenes. The length of the cycles and their determining cause are a deep mystery and are specifically related to the various kingdoms in nature, and to the species and types and forms within those aggregates of living processes. These cycles are known as yet only to the masters and to those initiates to whom is given the task of promoting the evolutionary process within the subhuman kingdom, and to the devas whose task it is to control the process. As you well know, the great distinction between the human kingdom in the three worlds and the other kingdoms in nature is the factor of free will. In the matter of death, this free will has, in the last analysis, a definite relation to the soul. The will of the soul is either consciously or unconsciously followed, where the decision of death is concerned, and this idea carries with it many implications which students would do well to ponder. We have arrived now at another major generalization as to disease and death in relation to humanity. Law 8. Disease and death are the result of two active forces. One is the will of the soul which says to its instrument, I draw the essence back. Higher other is the magnetic power of the planetary life which says to the life within the atomic structure, the hour of reabsorption has arrived. Return to me. Thus, under cyclic law, do all forms act. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 148 
A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing. The reference here is to the normal dissolution of the form at the close of a cycle of reincarnation. As we well know, this cycle is determined in the case of man by major psychological factors which can hasten or prolong the hour of the end, but only up to a certain point. The victim of the soul and the fiat of the planetary life are the final determining factors, except in the cases of war, accident, suicide or epidemic. The power of absorption with which the planet is endowed is very great within certain limitations. It is these limitations, for instance, which promote epidemics as the aftermath of war. Such epidemics have a serious effect upon the human race after the war cycle is over and after the consequent epidemic has spent itself. Humanity particularly in Eastern Europe, had not completely recovered from the epidemic, incident to the first part of the World War, when the second part took place. The psychological effects continued. The scars and the results of the second phase of that World War will persist for 50 years, even though, owing to man's greater scientific knowledge, the epidemic factor may be kept surprisingly within bounds. This, however, still remains uncertain. Time alone will demonstrate how successful humanity is in offsetting the penalties which outraged nature is apt to exact. Much good will be brought about through the growing custom to cremate those forms which the indwelling life has vacated. When it is an universal custom, we shall see a definite minimizing of disease, leading to longevity and increased vitality. The factor of resistance of the process whereby a form renders itself immune or non-responsive to the planetary pull and urge towards reabsorption requires the expenditure of much energy. When the life increases in potency within the form and there is less reaction to disease conveying factors, the soul within the form will have fuller sway and greater beauty of expression and usefulness and service. This will be true someday of all the kingdoms in nature, and thus we shall have a steady radiance shining forth in the mounting glory of the life of God. 3. Racial and National Diseases It must be apparent to you by now that I am principally concerned with indicating factors which are the result of the past history of the race rather than with giving you a specific and detailed account of the diseases which are allied to the various nations. This, in fact, it would not be possible to do, owing to the overlapping and paralleling which goes on in every department of natural life. Above everything else, I seek to make clear what must be done along the line of preventive healing and what should be accomplished in the difficult task of offsetting conditions already prevalent on Earth as the result of past misuse of the natural powers. There must therefore be brought about a healing of those conditions which are present upon our planet on a large scale, and consequently my emphasis will not be upon the specific and the individual. I am laying a foundation also for a discussion of our next theme, the relation of the law of karma to disease and death and to humanity as a whole. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 149 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing In the consideration of racial and national diseases, 
I do not intend to point out that tuberculosis is distinctively a disease of the middle classes in every country, that diabetes is a major trouble among the rice-eating peoples of the world, and that cancer is rampant in Great Britain, whilst heart disease is a prime cause of death in the United States. Such generalizations are both as true and as false as statistics usually are, and nothing is gained by laboring these points. These difficulties will all be offset in due time through the growth of understanding, by the intuitive diagnosis of disease, and by the magnificent work of scientific and academic medicine, plus a truer comprehension of right living conditions. I prefer rather to give still wider generalizations which will indicate causes and will not emphasize the consequences of these causes. I seek, therefore, to point out that 1. The soil of the planet itself is a major cause of disease and of contamination. For untold eons, the bodies of men and of animals have been laid away in the ground, that soil is consequently impregnated with the germs and the results of disease and this in a far subtler form than is surmised. The germs of ancient known and unknown diseases are to be found in the layers of the soil and the subsoil, these can still produce viral and trouble if presented with proper conditions. Let me state that nature never intended that bodies would be buried in the ground. The animals die and their bodies return to the dust, but return purified by the rays of the sun and by the breezes which blow and disperse. The sun can cause death as well as life, and the most virulent germs and bacteria cannot retain their potency if submitted to the dry heat of the sun's rays. Moisture and darkness foster disease as it emanates from and is nourished by bodies from whence the life aspect has been drawn. When, in all countries throughout the world, the rule is to submit dead forms to the ordeal by fire, and when this has become a universal and persistent habit, we shall then see a great diminution of disease in a much healthier world. 2. The psychological condition of a race or of a nation, as we have seen, produces a tendency to disease and to lower resistance to the causes of disease, it can engender an ability to absorb evil contamination with facility. On this I need not further enlarge. 3. Living conditions in many lands also foster disease and ill health. Dark and crowded tenements, underground homes, undernourishment, wrong food, evil habits of life and various occupational diseases, all contribute their quota to the general ill health of humanity. These conditions are universally recognized and much has been done to offset them, but much remains to be done. One of the good effects of the World War will be to force the needed changes, the required rebuilding, and the scientific nourishment of the youth of the race. National physical ills vary according to the predisposing occupations of the people. The diseases of an agricultural race will differ widely from those of a highly industrialized race. The physical predispositions of a sailor vary greatly from those of an office worker in one of our large cities. These items of information are again but the platitudes of the social worker in the many cities and lands. Certain diseases appear to be purely local, others seem universal in their effects, certain diseases are. Copyright Copyright 1998 Rufus Trust 150 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Gradually dying out, and new diseases are appearing. Certain forms of disease are forever with us, 
Others seem to be cyclic in their appearance. Some diseases are endemic whilst others are epidemic. How can this vast array of disease and forms of bodily ills come to be? How is it that some races are prone to succumb to one form of physical ill whilst other races are resistant to it? Climatic conditions produce certain typical diseases which remain strictly local and are not found elsewhere in the world. Cancer, tuberculosis, syphilis, spinal meningitis, pneumonia and heart disease, as well as scrofula using that term in its old sense to indicate certain forms of skin disease, are rampant throughout the world, taking their toll of millions, even though these diseases can be traced to certain great racial periods, they are now general in their effects. The clue to this can be found if students will remember that though the Atlantean racial period lies thousands of years away, a great majority of people today are basically Atlantean in their consciousness, and are therefore prone to the diseases of that civilization. If a full review of the health of the world were to be undertaken and presented to the thinking public, taken in normal conditions and not in war time, the question arises whether there are 100,000 perfectly healthy people to be found out of the billions now inhabiting the Earth. I think not. If no actual and active disease is present, nevertheless the condition of the teeth, the hearing and the sight leave frequently much to be desired. Inherited tendencies and active predispositions cause great concern, and to all this must be added psychological difficulty, mental diseases and definite brain trouble. All this presents an appalling picture. Against the ills which it discloses, medicine is today battling, Scientists are searching for alleviations and cures and for sound and lasting methods of eradication. Research students are investigating the latent germs, and health experts are seeking new ways to meet the onslaught of disease. Sanitation, compulsory inoculation, frequent inspection, pure food laws, Legal requirements and better housing conditions are all brought into this battle by the far-seeing humanitarian. Yet still disease is rampant, more hospitals are required and the death rate soars. To these practical agencies, mental science, new thought, unity and Christian science offer their aid, and seek quite honestly to bring the power of the mind to bear upon the problem. At the present stage, these agencies and groups largely are in the hands of fanatics and devoted, unintelligent people, they refuse all compromise and seem unable to recognize that the knowledge accumulated by medicine and by those who work scientifically with the human body is as God-given as their, as yet, in proven ideal. Later, the truths for which these groups stand will be added to the work of the psychologist and the physician. When this has been done, we shall see a great improvement. When the work of the doctor and the surgeon in relation to the physical body is recognized as essential and good, when the analysis and conclusions of the psychologist supplement their work, and when the power of right thought comes likewise as an aid, then and only then, shall we enter upon a new era of well-being. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 151 a Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing To the various categories of trouble must also be added a whole group of diseases which are more strictly mental in their effect, the cleavages, the insanities, the obsessions, the mental breaks, the aberrations and the hallucinations. 
To the various healing agencies mentioned above should be added the work undertaken by members of the spiritual hierarchy and their disciples. It takes soul power and knowledge, plus the wisdom of the other healing groups, to produce health among people, to empty our sanitariums, to rid humanity of the basic diseases, of lunacy and obsession, and to prevent crime. This is finally brought about by the right integration of the whole man, through a right comprehension of the nature of energy, and through a correct appreciation of the endocrine system, its glands and their subtle relationships. At present there is little coherent and integrated work done in unison by the four groups. 1. Physicians and Surgeons, Orthodox and Academic. 2. Psychologists, Neurologists and Psychiatrists. 3. Mental healers and new thought workers, plus unity thinkers and Christian scientists. 4. Trained disciples and those who work with the souls of men. When these four groups can be brought into close relation, and can work together for the release of humanity from disease, we shall then arrive at an understanding of the true wonder of the human being. We shall someday have hospitals in which the four phases of this one medical and remedial work will proceed side by side and in the fullest cooperation. Neither group can do a complete task without the others, all are interdependent. It is the inability of these groups to recognize the good in the other groups striving for the physical well-being of humanity which makes it almost impossible for me to do more specific teaching and more direct talking on these matters. Have you any idea of the wall of antagonistic thinking and speech against which a new or pioneering idea has to batter itself? Have you ever seriously considered the aggregated and crystallized thought forms with which all such new ideas, and shall I call them hierarchical proposals, have to contend? Do you appreciate the dead weight of preconceived and ancient determinations which have to be moved before the hierarchy can cause a new and needed concept to penetrate into the consciousness of the average thinking, or again should I say, unthinking? Public. The field of medicine is a most difficult field in which to work, for the subject is so intimate, and fear enters so strongly into the reactions of those who must be reached. The gulf between the old and established and the new and the spiritually demanded, needs much long and careful bridging. A great deal of the difficulty is, curiously enough, to be found fostered by the newer schools of thought. Orthodox medicine is slow, and rightly slow, in adopting new techniques and methods. It is at times too slow, but the case of the new mode of treatment or diagnosis must be rightly proven and statistically proven before it can be incorporated in the medical curriculum and methods. The risks to the human subject are too great, and the good humanitarian physician will not make his patient the subject. Copyright Copyright 1998 Uses Trust 152 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Of Experimentation However, within the last few decades, medicine has advanced by leaps and bounds, the science of electricity and light therapy and many other modern techniques and methods have already been added to the various other sciences of which medicine avails itself. The demands of the intangible and the treatment of the nebulous, if such peculiar terms are in order, are being recognized increasingly and are known to play an orthodox and recognized part in the newer approaches to disease. The approach of the mental schools and cults, as they erroneously call themselves, 
has not proceeded so helpfully. This is largely their fault. Schools of thought such as mental science, new thought, unity, Christian science, chiropractic enterprise, the efforts of the naturopaths and many others, hurt their cause, owing to the large claims which they make and to their unceasing attacks upon orthodox medicine and other channels of proven helpfulness and upon the knowledge acquired over centuries of experimentation of the academic schools of medicine and surgery. They forget that many of their claims to success, and they are often irrefutable, can be classed under the general heading of faith cures, and this can be done correctly or incorrectly. Such cures have long been recognized by the academic thinker and known to be factual. These cults which are in fact the custodians of needed truths, need above everything else to change their approach and to learn the spiritual nature of compromise in these days of evolutionary unfoldment. Their ideas cannot come into full and desired usefulness apart from the already God-given knowledge which medicine down the ages has accumulated, they need also to keep a record of their numerous failures, as well as the successes which they loudly proclaim. I would here point out that these successes are in no way so numerous as those of orthodox medicine and of the beneficent work done by the clinics of our hospitals which, in spite of failures and often gross stupidity, greatly ameliorate the pains and ills of the masses of men. These cults omit to state, or even to recognize, that in cases of extreme illness or accident, the patient is physically unable to affirm or claim divine healing and is dependent upon the work of some healer who works with no knowledge of the karma of the patient. Many of their so-called cures, and this is the case also with orthodox medicine, are cures because the hour of the end has not yet arrived for the patient and he would have recovered in any case, though he often does so more rapidly, owing to the remedial measures of the trained physician. In cases of serious accident, where the injured person will bleed, the cultist, no matter what his cult may be called, will perforce avail himself of the methods of the orthodox physician. He will apply a tourniquet, for instance, and take the measures which orthodox medicine enjoins, rather than stand by and see the injured person die because these methods are not used. When he is face to face with death, he will frequently turn to the tried and proved methods of help and will usually call in a physician rather than be charged with murder. All the above is said in no spirit of disparagement, but in an effort to prove that the many schools of thought, orthodox, academic, ancient, material or spiritual, new, pioneering or mental, are interdependent, they need to be brought together into one great healing science. This will be a copyright copyright 1998 Luce's Trust 153. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing. Science which will heal the whole man and bring into play all the resources, physical, emotional, mental and spiritual, of which humanity is capable. Orthodox medicine is more open to cooperation with the newer cults than are the neophytes of the science of mental control of disease. They cannot, however, permit their patients to be turned into guinea pigs, is not that the term used in these cases, brother of mine. For the satisfaction of the pioneering cultist and the proving of his theories, no matter how correct when applied in conjunction with what has already been proved. The middle way of compromise and of mutual cooperation is ever the wisest.
And this is a lesson much needed today in every department of human thinking. We shall now proceed to deal with our third and final section of thoughts around the basic causes of disease. The theme of karma has been little considered and I shall deal with it in a way larger than our particular subject perhaps warrants. Chapter 3. Our Karmic Liabilities. Introductory Remarks. We have reached now the concluding phase of our approach to the problem of disease. In our next part we shall deal with the attitudes and temperaments of the patient, taking into consideration his ray and also the state of mind of the healer. All these points are of prime importance when one comes to the consideration of the fine art of healing. It is, however, essential that ill health, acute disease, and death itself should find their place in the overall picture. A particular incarnation is not an isolated event in the life of the soul, but is a part and an aspect of a sequence of experiences which are intended to lead to one, clear, definite goal, the goal of free choice and a deliberate return out of matter to spirit and eventual liberation. There has been much talk among esotericists particularly in the Eastern presentation of the path to reality and end liberation. The goal held before the neophyte is liberation, freedom, emancipation, this, by and large, is the keynote of life itself. The concept is a transiting out of the realm of the purely selfish and of personal liberation into something much wider and more important. This concept of liberation lies behind the modern use of the word, liberty, but is far wiser, better and deeper in its connotation. Liberty, in the minds of many, is freedom from the imposition of any man's rule, freedom to do as one wishes, to think as one determines and to live as one chooses. This is as it should be, provided that one's wishes, choices, thoughts and desires are free from selfishness and are dedicated to the good of the whole. This is, as yet, very seldom. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 154 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing So Liberation is much more than all this It is freedom from the past Freedom to move forward along certain predetermined lines predetermined by the soul Freedom to express all the divinity of which one is capable as an individual or which a nation can present to the world There have been in the history of the past 2000 years four great symbolic happenings which have sequentially presented to those who have eyes to see ears to hear and minds to interpret the theme of liberation and not simply of liberty one the life of christ himself he for the first time presented the idea of the sacrifice of the unit consciously and deliberately offered for the service of the whole there had been other world saviors, but the issues involved had not so clearly been expressed, because the mind of man had not been ready to grasp the implications. Service is the keynote of liberation. Christ was the ideal server. 2. The signing of the Magna Charta. This document was signed at Runnymede, during the reign of King John on June 15, 1215, A.D. Here the idea of liberation from authority was presented with the emphasis upon the personal liberty and rights of the individual. The growth and development of this basic idea, mental concept and formulated perception falls into four phases or chapters. A. The signing of the Magna Charta, emphasizing personal liberty. 
B. The founding of the French Republic with its emphasis upon human liberty. Circa. The Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. Determining national policy. D. The Atlantic Charter and the Four Freedoms, bringing the whole question into the international field, and guaranteeing to men and women everywhere in the world liberty and freedom to develop the divine reality within themselves. The ideal has gradually become clarified so that today the mass of men everywhere know what are the basic essentials of happiness. 3. The Emancipation of the Slaves The spiritual idea of human liberty, which had become a recognized ideal, became a demanding desire, and a great symbolic happening took place, the slaves were freed. Like all things which human beings enact, perfection is non-existent. The Negro is not free in this land of the free, and America will have to clean house in this respect. To put it in clear concise words, the USA must see to it that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are facts and not a dream. Only thus can the inevitable working of the law of karma, which is our theme today, be offset. The Negroes are Americans as well as the New Englanders and all other stocks which are not indigenous in this country, and the Constitution is theirs also. As yet, copyright copyright 1998 Luce's Trust. 155. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 4. Esoteric Healing. The privileges it confers are withheld by those who are the slaves of selfishness and fear. 4. The liberation of humanity by the United Nations. We are participating in a great spectacular and symbolic happening and are watching it in process. The liberation of the individual has moved onward through the symbolic liberation of a section of humanity, the remnants of the first two races, the Lemurian and the Atlantean, to the liberation of millions of human beings, enslaved by the forces of evil, by millions of their fellow men. The ideal has worked through into a practical worldwide effort upon the physical plane and has demanded worldwide sacrifice. It has involved the entire three worlds of human evolution, and for this reason the Christ can now lead his forces and aid human beings to liberate mankind. What has really been happening? Therefore, in the lives of individuals, in the lives of nations and in the life of humanity. A tremendous move to put right most ancient evil, to offset consciously the law of cause and effect by a recognition of the causes in the personal, national and international worlds which have produced the effects under which humanity today suffers. The law of karma is today a great and incontrovertible fact in the consciousness of humanity everywhere. They may not call it by that name, but they are well aware that in all today's events the nations are reaping what they sowed. This great law, at one time a theory, is not a proven fact and a recognized factor in human thinking. The question, why? So frequently asked brings in the factor of cause and effect with constant inevitability. The concepts of heredity and of environment are efforts to explain existing human conditions, qualities, racial characteristics, national temperaments and ideals prove the fact of some initiating world of causes. Historical conditions the relationships between nations, social taboos, religious convictions and tendencies can all be traced to originating causes, some of them most ancient. 
everything that is happening in the world today and which is so potently affecting humanity, things of beauty and of horror, modes of living and civilization and culture, prejudices and likings, scientific attainment and artistic expression and the many ways in which humanity throughout the planet colors existence, are aspects of effects, initiated somewhere, on some level at some time, by human beings, both individually and en masse. Karma is therefore that which man, the heavenly man in whom we live, humanity as a whole, mankind in groups as nations, and individual man, has instituted, carried forward, endorsed, omitted to do or has done right through the ages until the present moment. Today, the harvest is ripe and mankind is reaping what it has sown, preparatory to a fresh plowing in the springtime of the new age, with a fresh sowing of the seed which will let us pray and hope produce a better harvest. The outstanding evidence of the law of cause and effect is the Jewish race. All nations prove this law, but I choose to refer to the Hebrew peoples because their history is so well known and their future and their destiny are subjects of worldwide, universal concern. The Jews have, copyright copyright 1998 Lucas Trust, 156, a treatise on the seven rays, volume 4, esoteric healing always had a symbolic significance, they sum up in themselves, as a nation, down the ages, the depths of human evil and the heights of human divinity. Their aggressive history as narrated in the Old Testament is on a par with present-day German accomplishment, yet Christ was a Jew and it was the Hebrew race which produced him. Let this never be forgotten. The Jews were great aggressors. They despoiled the Egyptians and they took the promised land at the point of the sword, sparing neither man, woman nor child. Their religious history has been built around a materialistic Jehovah, possessive, greedy and endorsing and encouraging aggression. Their history is symbolic of the history of all aggressors, rationalizing themselves into the belief that they are carrying out divine purpose, wresting away from people their property in a spirit of self-defense and finding some reason, adequate to them, to excuse the iniquity of their action. Palestine was taken by the Jews because it was a land flowing with milk and honey, and the claim was made that the act was undertaken in obedience to divine command. Later, the symbolism gets most interesting. They divided into two halves. The Israelites with headquarters at Samaria, and the Jews meaning two or three special tribes out of the twelve locating around Jerusalem. Dualism ran through their religious beliefs. They were schooled by the Sadducees or the Pharisees, and these two groups were in constant conflict. Christ came as a member of the Jewish race and they renounced him. Today the law is working, and the Jews are paying the price, factually and symbolically, for all they have done in the past. They are demonstrating the far-reaching effects of the law. Factually and symbolically, they stand for culture and civilization, Factually and symbolically, they are humanity, factually and symbolically, they stand as they have ever chosen to stand, for separation. They regard themselves as the chosen people and have an innate consciousness of that high destiny, forgetting their symbolic role and that it is humanity which is the chosen people and not one small and unimportant fraction of the race. Factually and symbolically, they long for unity and cooperation, 
yet know not how to cooperate. Factually and symbolically, they are the eternal pilgrim, they are mankind, wandering through the mazes of the three worlds of human evolution, and gazing with longing eyes towards a promised land. Factually and symbolically, they resemble the mass of men, refusing to comprehend the underlying spiritual purpose of all material phenomena, rejecting the Christ within, as they did centuries ago the Christ within their borders grasping for material good and steadily rejecting the things of the spirit. They demand the so-called restitution of Palestine, wresting it away from those who have inhabited it for many centuries, and by their continued emphasis upon material possession they lose sight of the true solution, which is that, symbolically and factually again, they must be assimilated into all the nations, and pleased with all the races, thus demonstrating recognition of the one humanity. Thank <laughs> you.